Come on, I want you to name the name of your city. Speak the name of your city where you live. And I want you to ask God to release his life and his glory over that place. God, release your glory. Release your glory, Lord God. Release your glory, Lord God. We don't ask you for judgment. God, we ask you for mercy. We ask you to release your glory over Greenwich today, God. God, we ask you to release your glory over Stanford. God, would you release your glory over Port Chester, God. God, would you release your glory over Rye. Come on, Church of God. God, release your glory over New Rochelle, over Armonk, over White Plains. God, release your glory over Fairfield County. Release your glory over Westchester County, Lord God. God, we ask you to release your glory right now over New York City. Come on, lift your hands, everybody, all over the room. Come on, we ask you, God, for your mercy. We ask you for your glory to be released over New York City. God, would you send that spirit of conviction from the Holy Spirit that we read about, God, in the great prayer revival of the past. God, would you let your Holy Spirit come. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, would you send your spirit to New York. Father, release your glory over the Bronx today. Father, release your glory over Manhattan today. Father, would you release your glory over Staten Island. Father, release your glory, we ask, over Brooklyn. Release your glory over Queens. Come on, cry out to God for mercy. Cry out to God. God, release your glory and your fire and your power, Lord God. Release it over our lives. Release your glory, God, over our nation. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah. Hephzibah was a name that meant my delight is in her. And your land Beulah, which means married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord do not keep silent and give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Over the past few weeks, Pastor Glenn's been sharing with us about praying great prayers. And we're going to continue talking about great prayers today. And I'd like to share with you this morning about praying the prayer of the watchman. Praying the prayer of the watchman. Let's pray together as we look into the word of God together today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the word of God. It is a lamp for our feet and it's a light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Lord, we pray that our hearts would be good soil right now to receive the seed of the word of God, to retain it, and to produce good fruit. Jesus said that the words that he speaks to us are spirit and life. So, Father, I pray that you would send the Holy Spirit and minister life from the word of God to your people now. I ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, the book of Isaiah is one of the most enduring books in all the history of literature. Within its pages, we find some of the most inspiring poetry in all of the scripture. Isaiah himself, personally, he was the very picture of an anointed scribe. He was eloquent. He was well-educated. According to tradition, we know that Isaiah was a prince. In fact, his uncle was the king, Uzziah, that you read about in his book. But Isaiah's beautiful poems and songs really only have their meaning for us because of their subject. Isaiah stands out to us because out of all the prophets, he is the one who had the clearest vision of the glory of Jesus Christ. God used the words of Isaiah to give hope and to give faith to the people of Israel. 
I think Isaiah knew that his ministry might be met with unbelief. After all, he is the one who gave us that famous phrase, who has believed our report. But God showed Isaiah more than anyone else the sufferings of Messiah and the glory that would follow those sufferings. God also showed him how Christ would bring the glory of God to the people of God and to the city of God. Isaiah saw the beauty and the majesty of Jesus so clearly that his book has sometimes been called the Gospel of Isaiah. And inside this wonderful book, we're looking today at one of its most glorious sections. In this portion of the book, we can see the glory of God coming to the people of God. In Isaiah 60, God says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. In chapter 61, the Holy Spirit comes upon the Messiah to enable him to get us the victory, as we sang about today. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And our reading today, taken from Isaiah 62, is different from the more famous chapters that come before it. It's different because it has a different cast of characters. In Isaiah 60 and 61, we see all three persons of the Godhead working together to bring about salvation and glory. You see the Father at work. You see Christ at work, of course. And you see the Spirit also at work. But in Isaiah 62, where we've read, there's a new character in the story. There is someone else who has a role to play in seeing to it that the glory of God comes to the city. And that person is you and me. If you and I are willing, we can respond to the invitation that God gives us in this chapter. It's an invitation to participate in making the dream of God come true. Now, I know a lot of modern thinking is concerned with finding out how God can make our dreams come true. But in this passage of scripture, God is actually inviting you to help make his dream come true. God has a dream of his glory coming into your city and into your family. And he's inviting you to pray that dream back to him until it becomes a reality. How many of you think it would be a great thing to see the glory of God invading and settling over your home and your city? And we've been talking about praying great prayers, and Pastor Glenn has had some really great messages in this series. If you missed any of them, please do yourself a favor. Get the CD, visit our website at htchurch.com and listen to that. We're also on YouTube now, and we've set up an easier address so you can get there better and easier. Just go to htchurch.tv, and you can watch any message that you might have missed there. And over these weeks, Pastor has been sharing that great prayers are big. And their intercessory, they aim for big goals in the spirit. They're intercessory because they stand in the gap for other people. They're not just praying for our own needs. Great prayers are biblical. We pray according to God's word and according to God's will. And that builds our faith. See, the Bible says that if we ask for anything according to his will, then we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we also are assured that we will have the petitions that we've sought from him. Great prayers are benevolent. They wish other people well because they reflect the heart of a God who means well for people. And great prayers are bold. Bold praying dares to rise up in faith and pray until the answer is received, even when people around you tell you, as people sometimes do, that what you're praying for is impossible. But I want to submit to you today that few prayers could be as bold as praying God's heart back to him and asking him to bring his glory to your home and to your city. Few prayers can be as big as asking God to change your city and your home so that it becomes, as we read in this passage, the object of people's praise. God says your life can be changed by his glory. And when you come to church, instead of people saying, oh boy, here she comes, 
God can turn things around so that you become the object of their praise. See, God would love for people to see you coming down the parking lot and saying, oh, good, she's here today. What a blessing. And I want to look with you this morning at how we can pray like a watchman and see God's heart for your life, for your home, for your city become a reality. In our text, I see four keys to doing that, to praying like a watchman. And the first one is this. Ask God to put you on the wall. Ask God to put you on the wall. God says in verse 6, I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. Here the Lord says that he's positioned people on the wall of the city as watchmen. You know, in the ancient world, being a watchman was one of the most responsible positions in the city. In those days, there was, of course, there was no radar or anything like that. There weren't even spy glasses or binoculars yet. And so few things could be more important than having a good set of eyes strategically positioned somewhere in an elevated spot to see what might be coming against the city. There were different kinds of watchtowers. Some, of course, would be in the city, but there were also observation posts in high places around the country. There were also towers in the fields that helped people defend their crops. Israel was a small nation then, as it is today, and so it's always been vital over there to get intelligence quickly. Just as the kings and leaders of the people would station their watchmen on the fortresses and towers, in just the same way, God positions watchmen of prayer on the fortresses and towers of his kingdom. Amen. What are the qualifications to be a watchman on the wall? First, a watchman must be faithful. Faithful. Being a watchman, I'm sure, was often a, fa uh, a thankless task. Out there in the elements, exposed in all kinds of weather. It demands a commitment to uninterrupted service. You know, without dependable watchmen, the city would be in grave trouble. Second, watchmen must be vigilant because the consequences of falling asleep on the job could be disastrous. I guess watchmen were not allowed to text on the job. <laughs> the lives of the king's army and even the lives, of course, of the civilians in the city would be put at risk if the watchman were to become careless about his duties. And third, watchmen needed to have a heart for the city. Money and recognition are not enough to keep people sharp on their post on top of the wall. And the king would know that only people who had the right motivation, who truly loved their city, could be counted upon. See, in the Hebrew language, the watchman here is more than just a mere Look out. It means he is someone who guards the city. And I believe that you can only really guard something that you love and care about. I think it works the same way for watchmen in the kingdom of God. Like those ancient kings of Israel, God has his own effective watchmen of prayer. What sets them apart is that they're faithful in prayer. They're vigilant in prayer. And they have a heart for the work. They love the people and the families, and they love the churches that God has appointed them to guard over in prayer. If we think about the watchmen in the body of Christ, we'll see that there are two different kinds of watchmen, and we need to take a look at them quickly. The first kind of watchman is a watchman who was drafted, who was drafted. Now, some of you are old enough to remember that in the old days, when there was a military draft, you had no say in the matter about going into the service. A telegram came to your house, and you opened it up, and you said, oh, golly gee. And uh, you were told to report for duty. And some people are watchmen because they were drafted into the service. It's part of their calling. It goes along with the territory of what God has asked them to do in their ministry. Pastors are among those who have been summoned to be watchmen. Through prayer and through love of the flock, they pray until they see the purposes of God being birthed in the people. See, Paul told the church in Galatia, he said, my little children, he said, I'm travailing in birth for you again until Christ is formed in you. They stand vigilant in prayer and they bear the saints of God on their hearts. 
local intercessors in the local church, they join pastors in carrying the burden of the flock. God gives these saints a special love and a special sense of being drawn to the work of prayer. The needs of the saints are always on their hearts, and they can often be found bringing people's names before the throne of grace. Others are called by God to stand faithful in their intercession in whatever sphere of ministry God has given to them. Apostles and prophets may carry a special burden to intercede for different geographic regions and to pray until revival comes in different countries. Evangelists cry out to God for the spread of the gospel. They cry out to God for lost souls to be saved. Christian workers of all kinds may feel a need to pray, a call to pray on an ongoing basis for different leaders and different ministries. And I believe that over the span of years, the intercession of all of these faithful servants helps to propel the advance of the kingdom of God. See, vigilant watchmen truly are, as Derek Prince put it, they really are shaping history through prayer and through fasting. All of these watchmen have a task in prayer and they have a duty to discharge because it's part of the divine calling upon their lives. But there's another kind of watchman, another kind of guardian who was not drafted into the service. And you may be here today and you're not a pastor or your ministry calling may not be like some of those I mentioned. But you can still be positioned on the wall and you can still shape the destiny of your home in prayer. You can still take your post and pray to see the glory of God come down because the second kind of watchman is a volunteer. See, God not only has a draft, but he's also like the Marines. He's looking for a few good men. God is seeking men and women who are willing to enlist in an army of prayer that will release his presence into our region through their intercession. God is looking for some to rise up and say, God, I will stand on guard for my home. I will stand on guard for my city. I'm tired of what's going on in my neighborhood and in my nation. I'm going to reach out to you in faith. And even if nobody else is watching and praying, God, you're going to find me when you look down on the walls of my city in prayer. Hear God's heart today in Jeremiah 12. God said, many rulers have destroyed my vineyard. They've trodden down my portion, meaning my land, underfoot. They've made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They've made it desolate, and desolate it mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate because no one takes it to heart. You hear that? Because no one takes it to heart. God laments the fact that his beloved land was being destroyed and made empty. Four times, four times in that little passage, God used the word uh, desolate. And what does that mean? It means that it was empty. It was empty of blessing. It was empty of life. It was empty of his presence. Why? Because no one was taking it to heart. Nobody cared enough to stir themselves up to reach out to God and lay a hold of the hem of God's garment. Too few citizens of Zion could find the courage to get up on a watchtower and warn their friends against what was coming and cry out to God to bring his presence back to the land so that at least one more time there might be streams in the desert. When they saw an empty spot on the wall, they didn't climb up and begin to cry out to the God of angel armies. Isaiah had raised a similar complaint when he said, there is no one who calls on your name. There is no one who stirs himself up to take hold of you. Now, I don't think we have no one in that position. I do think we have some saints who are stirring themselves up to call on the name of God. Amen? Amen. God is looking for a few good men and women of prayer, some moms and dads. Some grandmas and grandpas who will look around like watchmen and take note of the destruction that the devil is bringing on our kids. Children afflicted by drugs, by mental instability, by fatherlessness. Can't say amen, say oh my there. 
God is looking for people who will call upon his name and stir themselves up to take hold of him. People who will rise up and say, that's it, I've had enough. I'm going up on my tower, and I'm going to cry out to the only one who has the power to fix the situation, the only one who can change the lives of young people. have to embarrass my wife, Patty. Patty's decided to go up on her tower and pray for all the kids and teens and young adults that she knows who are facing trouble. People are sending her names now of young people to pray for. And she has a certain day in the week when she goes and hides away and cries out to God for all those kids. And you know we're seeing results from that already. <laughs> you know, sometimes when the crisis point, when the crisis moment comes in the life of your kid, your grandkid, that's not the disaster. That's God breaking in and bringing things to a head. Now listen, I'm glad that people are sending my wife names and saying, pray for my kid too. But what we really need is more moms and dads. And moms and dads, I know you're praying. But what we need is more people to say, I'm going up on that tower with you. I'm going to stand guard with you over the lives of our kids and our grandkids. And together we're going to cry out to the Lord to come in his presence and break the back of the thing that's trying to make the lives of our kids into a desolation. We're going to cry out to the Lord, as God says there in Isaiah 62, until he establishes our kids, means makes them strong. We're going to cry out to him until he establishes our kids and makes them a praise in the earth. God's looking for a few good men and women, people who have the spiritual sight to see the crime, the corruption, the cynicism that's plaguing our cities and say, I have seen enough and I've had enough. I'm going to take my post up on the wall and if I'm the only one who's crying out to God for my city, I'm going to be here in prayer and in fasting until I see something happening, something shift, something move, something change. One day a week, two days a week, whatever it takes. Remember a few years ago, they used to have those uh, silly commercials when they were trying to get us to buy all those almonds, right? You remember that? They had these two old farmers and they were trying to get you to buy a can of almonds and the guy would say, a can a week, that's all we ask. <laughs> well, God, I think, is coming to this house today and saying, one day a week, give me one day a week in prayer and fasting. That's all I'm asking. Your city is dying your nation is collapsing down around your ears. Give me one day a week even in prayer and fasting to turn this thing around. Give me one lunch a week. Give up one lunch to get a heart for lost people that would love to be able to sing the songs and experience what we experience in here, the joy, the peace, the forgiveness that we have through Jesus Christ that we sing about in here every Sunday morning. Now, some of us, because we're just barraged with the news. Some of us may be already giving up on seeing God move again. You say, oh, Pastor Nick, it's so bad now. It's worse than it's ever been. They're doing all these terrible things that have never been done before. I know, I got a TV. I can see those things too, but you know what? Seeing the problem, seeing the danger is only half the job of a watchman. The other half of the job of the watchman is to cry out for help. Some of us were drafted by God and called by God to go up on the watchtower of prayer because of what we do. But I think there's many more people who volunteered to be guardians of prayer. And God still needs many more volunteers to go up into the place of watching and praying until the spirit changes lives and families and neighborhoods. I hope you'll tell him today that you want to be one of those who stands guard in prayer. How can you pray like a watchman? That's the first key. Ask God to put you on the wall of the city. The second key is this. Ask God to give you double vision. Ask God to give you double vision. In order to have faith, in order to hang on, in order to keep praying, you're going to have to pray with some hope. And you're going to need to have double vision. See, to be a good watchman, not only do you need to spot the dangers that are coming against your family and your city, but you also need to be able to see by faith the help that God desires to give you. 
There are many watchmen intercessors. There are even many watchmen ministries who can see the reality we face. But we also need to be able to see by faith the possibilities that God says he will make available when we pray. And that's what I'm calling double vision. I want you to notice in the beginning of Isaiah 62 where we read there is somebody there who tells us about God's heart for the city. There is somebody who's telling us in the beginning of that chapter about how God desires to bless the people and the city. And I'll let you in on a little secret. The mystery speaker is the Messiah himself. It's the Lord Jesus. In verse 1, he says this, For Zion's sake, for the sake of the people of God and the city, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. That's God's heart. And in the rest of the chapter, he describes the great changes and the great glory that will come when the people of God rise up and begin to join him in praying for those things that he says he wants to see happen. This is good stuff right here. What does God intend to do for his people? In verse 1, he says, when God's people pray, their righteousness will be obvious. Wouldn't you love it for everybody to know for it to be an obvious thing how righteous your spouse and your kids were. Oh, everybody knows how great his kids are. Everybody knows how righteous that family is. Wouldn't you love for that to be the testimony of your house? But God says when you pray, your righteousness will go forth. It's going to be an obvious thing that people can see. In verse 2, he says the unbelievers and their kings will see the glory of God on you. Well, I know that that person follows God because God is all over them. The light of God is on their countenance. The glory of God is upon their head. They're blessed in everything that they do. It'll become easy for you to bring the light of God to people. In verse 3, he says that when you pray, you will become a crown of glory in the hand of God. That sounds good. See, that's very powerful symbolism in Hebrew thinking. And what it really means is if you were a man's crown, it means that you're his wife. It means there that you would be married to God. In other words, God is saying, when you pray for my glory to come to you in your home, you're going to have a closeness and a depth of relationship with me that you never even knew was possible. And that's worth praying and striving for. In verse 4, he says, when God's people pray, he said, the city will no longer be desolate. And it will no longer be empty of God's presence. He says, your name will be, from now on, he says, your name will be Hephzibah. Now, your kids are not running into too many Hephzibahs on the playground nowadays. But Hephzibah is a lovely old Hebrew name. It means, my delight is in her. Awesome. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our cities were places that God looked at and said, my delight is in her. Wouldn't it be awesome if the place where you live was a center of revival once again? If people heard about your city and said, oh, you live there? I want to go there because I heard that that's where God moves. It can happen again when God's people pray. I want to share with you what happened in the great prayer revival of 1857. I'm going to read you here a brief excerpt from the Pentecostal Evangel magazine. What's been called the zone of holy influence, oh, I like that, the zone of holy influence or the invisible cloud of God's presence has been clearly documented during times of revival in the U.S. and especially in the prayer meeting revival of 1857. New York Harbor became an unlikely center of revival as crew members and passengers on a number of ships were saved before going ashore. When the battleship, the North Carolina, was anchored in New York Harbor, four Christians, just, just four, met on board for a prayer meeting. They were mocked and ridiculed as they prayed, but soon the mocking and jeering turned to cries for mercy as the Holy Spirit began convicting the crew. For several days, the Holy Spirit moved. Now listen to this next. Ministers were sent for. Can you see this happening on Fleet Week? 
the Navy's coming into town and we get a call tomorrow morning, Pastor Glenn, Pastor Nick, send us some pastors. This is the Navy. We need some pastors. And many former mockers were converted. A number of ships entered this zone of holy influence and saw lives changed. From 100 to 150 miles offshore, it seems that the Holy Spirit moved as ships approached New York and many passengers and crew members were converted. Some ships had ministers sent to them before they docked. Many people arrived in New York Harbor as Christians who had embarked on their voyages as unbelievers. Praise God. Now that's not just something that God did in a church history book. That is something that God can still do today and that God wants to do for his people and for their communities. A watchman sees God's vision, hears his heart for people, and needs to pray in accordance with God's heart. One preacher said it this way, true prayer begins and ends at the throne of God. Get that? True prayer begins and ends at the throne of God. See, anybody can take requests and needs to the throne of God. And of course, we need to do that. I'm not downgrading that in any way. But a watchman goes to see what God is saying to the city. Then he stands watch over it in prayer to make sure that God's vision comes to pass and is not hindered or thwarted in any way. The prophet Habakkuk said, I'm going to set myself on the tower and I'm going to wait and watch to see what he says to me. Decide to pray out of what God is saying. Decide to pray out of what God is wanting to do. Decide to pray out of what God says he desires to do for his people. This is a temptation for us. Don't pray out of the spirit of Jonah. See, the enemy would love to push us into that harsh spirit because, as I said, we're so barraged with this negative news and we just want to say, get him, God. That was the spirit on Jonah, you know. Jonah refused to go on the mission that God gave him. Why? He said, God, I don't want to go there and preach to those people because I know you're merciful. <laughs> don't we have the same thing? You believe that God is merciful, that God wants to save sinners? How many of you believe that? But see, as people of prayer, as intercessors, as watchmen, we cannot pray strike them dead prayers. The stance, the position, the mindset of an intercessor has to be the mindset of mercy because God wants to take your miserable city or your miserable spouse. And that doesn't apply to you. It applies to your neighbor, I know. But he wants to take, listen, he wants to take your miserable city or your miserable spouse and turn them into a blessing and a praise instead of a curse. Don't you see the problem? You know, anybody can do that. You don't have to be an anointed prophet of God to find a problem. Get a case of double vision and see what God wants to accomplish in the places and in the people that you're praying for. All right, four keys to praying like a watchman. Ask God to put you on the wall. Second, ask God to give you double vision. And the third one is this. Become God's secretary. Become God's secretary. Isaiah 62 shows us the Lord's heart, but it also shows us the responsibility that we bear as watchmen. In verse 6 and 7, he says, I've set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord do not keep silent and give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. That's a critical part of our call as watchmen of prayer. We're called to be a people who make mention of the Lord. Now that translation really isn't the best. The better translation is this, and your Bible probably has it this way. Instead of saying make mention of the Lord, it should say you who remind the Lord. Everybody say it, remind. If you want to be a watchman, you need to remind the Lord. Remind the Lord of what? of everything that he said he wanted to do. 
I want to teach you an ancient Hebrew word today, and they're fun to say, so I want you all to say it. It's mazkirim. Mazkirim. What are mazkirim? The mazkirim were the people in verse 6 who God said need to be reminding the Lord. They were royal officials in Israel. They were part of the king's court, and they had a very important job. See, their job was to remind the king of the things that he needed to do. Interesting. Uh, moms and dads, I think in Veggie Tales, I think the Maz Kareem was played by a little green pea, if I'm not mistaken. See, some of you know what I'm talking about. But their job was to remind the king of things he needed to do, of things, listen, remind the king of things uh, that he had obligated himself to do for people. Mm. When nothing much looked like it was happening, it was the job of the Maz Kareem to speak up and remind the king of what he had said. Your majesty, don't forget. Passover is coming up next month, and we need to get ready because we have to prepare the gifts that you always give to the poor. Your Majesty, don't forget, we passed through that little village about six months ago, and you said you would help them get a new water supply. That was the job of the Mas Karim, and I think you can see that there are a couple of important qualifications to be in that position. First, you had to know what the king had said. And his watchmen today, it's the same for us. We need to know the word of God. We need to know what God has said about things, both in his written word and in his prophetic voice also, so that we can remind him of what he said. Second, to be one of these Mas Karim, I think you had to be a little bold. You had to be bold enough to be able to speak out in the presence of the king, you had to be bold enough to interrupt him and remind him when it seemed that he was being forgetful or maybe the king just wasn't moving fast enough for everybody's liking. Jacob prayed that way. He remembered and he treasured in his heart what God had said and then he was bold enough to go back to God and pray his own words back to him. When he was coming back into the promised land, Jacob said, O God of my fathers, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. Deliver me, I pray you, from the hand of my brother. He says, you said, you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. See how he remembered what God had said. And he reminded God. The great men and women of God all prayed that way. Moses, David, and Daniel, and many others. Listen, some of the prayers that David prays in the Psalms, they strike us as being disrespectful. You'd almost be fearful to pray like that, to get up in God's grill, you know? But I want to tell you that they didn't see it as disrespect. You know what they saw it as? They saw it as faith. They saw it as something that God had invited them to do, to pray that way so that he could demonstrate his goodness and his faithfulness to the people that he had taken to be his own people. By the way, in, in modern Hebrew, uh, in Israel today, people, many people still do have Maz Karim. In modern Hebrew, Maz Karim is how you say secretary. So let's be the Maz Karim of God. Let's be his secretaries to remind him of his good promises. That's how we can be effective watchmen. Four keys to becoming a watchman. First, ask God to put you on the wall. Second, ask him for double vision. And third, become his secretary. The last one is this. Pray until your dreams and God's dreams come true. Pray until your dreams and God's dreams come true. Pastor Jason and team, please come back if you would. As watchmen who are positioned on the wall of the city, we've been called to never hold our peace day or night. We need to learn again that that was one of the great secrets of the power of the early church and in every time of revival in church history is to pray without ceasing, to have day and night prayer. We need to learn once again what it means to bring our loved ones to the throne of God unceasingly. 
How many of you believe that God can touch our families and restore people and cities? If we really believe that, then that's our call is to rise up and call upon his name unceasingly until we see that occur. Do we have set times of prayer? Do you have a set hour of the day? Do you have a set time in the week when you meet with God? It was Corey Ten Boom who said, don't pray when you feel like it. I like that. Don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. A man is powerful on his knees. Great quote. Don't be silent and don't give up. Church, I want to encourage you. Pick your special hour of the day. Your appointment with the king. Pick your special day of the week. Whatever it is. Wait on God. Wait on the Lord to show you. From now on Wednesday, let's say. Whatever it is. That's going to be my day of the week. And I'm going to fast. And I'm going to pray that day. And I'm going to bring my kids and my grandkids. And I'm going to bring my neighborhood and my city to the throne of grace. I'm going to reach out to God as a watchman on the wall. Jesus said we should pray and not faint, not give up. You know, the funny thing about that is the enemy has so twisted our thinking about prayer that he's convinced so many of us that if we keep going to God for something, that we're bothering God. I've heard that many times, and maybe you have too. But it's actually quite the opposite. God is the one who says in those verses, he says, I am putting watchmen on the wall specifically for the purpose of bothering me until you see what I've promised come to pass. I want to be somebody that bothers God. See, it's the world that says to you, when are you going to give up and stop praying? But that's not what God says. God's looking at us and saying, why did you give up and stop praying? We need to keep praying and keep pressing in with a heart of tenacity like Jacob who laid a hold of the angel of God and said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. We need to give God no rest until, as he says in verse 7, until he establishes the city until he establishes what pertains to you and makes it a praise in the earth. That is the will of God. That our lives would be established and made strong. That our kids' lives would be established and made strong. That our homes would be established as sanctuaries of peace and blessing filled with the glory of God. That should be our prayer. That our cities would be reclaimed from the dominion of sin and that kids would be lifted out, teenagers would be lifted out from the cycle of despair and depression and drugs. Jesus started off this chapter telling us that for the sake of Zion, he would not be silent. And he's calling us today to be watchmen who will echo his heart. Just like him, we're called not to be silent but to keep reminding God of the promises that he's made until he establishes the city and makes it a praise. We need to get back, church, hear me. We need to get back to some of those old ways and make them new again. Pick your positions, your spot, your watch on the wall and stand on your tower and pray. Ask God to put you on the wall of prayer once again. Maybe some of you came down. Maybe some of you used to do that back in the day when everybody was slightly more Pentecostal. And maybe it's time to get back on the wall. Have a set time of prayer for these things. Have that set day of the week to fast and pray. Pray with double vision. Look at the earth below and look at the heaven above and pray until what you see down here matches what's in God's heart up there. Say, what kind of, what kind of strange prayer is that? I don't know. It sounds kind of like something I heard when I was a kid. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Become God's secretary. Remember what God said and remind him of his good promise. Pray until you see your dream and God's dream for your household become a reality. Pray until the targets of your prayers have become established and strong. Pray until the target of your prayers has become a praise and not a curse anymore. God has some cities, God has some places in our nation that have become a curse. You know what I'm talking about. I don't have to list the names of any cities. You know how you can tell? When you hear the name of a city, you say, oh man, am I glad I don't live there. 
But God can take that place from being a curse to being a blessing where people will say, well, wow, I want to go there and see God move because I've heard that God is doing things there. God wants your life to become a praise, your home, your kids, your neighborhood, your city, and even your nation. Hear the word of the Lord today, Harvest Time. God is saying to us, I have set watchmen on your walls, people of God. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who remind the Lord, do not keep silent and give me no rest, he says, until I establish and until I make you a praise in the earth. Let's offer ourselves to the Lord again so that we once again can pray the prayer of the watchman. Come on, stand and let's give Jesus praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Come on, give Jesus a great praise. He's worthy. Give him a clap offering and exalt the Lord who reigns in majesty. Hallelujah. 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 Let's sing that song, Hosanna, as a way to worship our kid, uh, our king, and cry out to the Lord that his name would be lifted high over our lives and cities. Amen. Pastor Jason. Hosanna in the Lift your hands and sing it. Hosanna, save now, Lord. Hosanna, I'll sing one more. Hosanna, Lord. Exalted, O Lord. Be exalted, your majesty. Be exalted, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 The Lord is putting out a call for watchmen today. To become a watchman or to return to that place of becoming a watchman. We've got just a few minutes left, but I want to invite you, if that's on your heart, if you want to offer yourself to the Lord as a volunteer and say, God, put me on the wall as a watchman of prayer. Slip out of your seat real fast. Let's come down to the front. Make sure you come all the way up to the front to leave space for those that are behind you. Come on. You're coming. You're saying, Lord, I want you to position me as a watchman. I'm going to stand guard in prayer, or I'm going to stand guard again in prayer for my family, for my life, my children, my neighborhood, my city, my workplace, whatever it is. It's a mess. The glory of God can come in and transform it. We believe, God, that you have power to change, to transform. We believe, God, that it's in your heart. We believe, Jesus, that you've said, for the sake of Zion, I will not keep silent until her righteousness is like a burning lamp that's obvious and bright. Hallelujah. Come on, I want you to lift your hands. Just begin to tell the Lord, God, this is what I want. I want you to give me, release to me that spirit of intercession and prayer in my life once again. God, I want to return. Come on, tell him, God, I want to return to that place of prayer with you. He's not condemning today. He's releasing. He's forgiving. He's recommissioning. He's relaunching you to be a watchman. There's spots on the wall. There's spots on the wall. Some have moved on. Some have moved away. Some have gone home to be with the Lord. And there's spots on the wall that need to be filled by a new generation of prayer warriors, of intercessors who bear the names of the people of God in their heart. I want to ask you to lay your hands on your eyes if you would. Lord, I ask you to anoint our eyes. Come on, say, Lord, anoint my eyes. Give me double vision. Tell him, say, Lord, I'm returning to your word so I can see your good intention 
for me and your good plan for my house. Let me see your good plan for my city. Let me see your heart of mercy for America. Give me seeing eyes. Give me a listening ear to respond to the voice of the Spirit. God put me on the wall with the eyes of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands to the Lord. Lift your hands to the Lord. Say, God, I'm coming to meet with you. Come on, say that. I'm coming to meet with you, God. On behalf of others. I'm volunteering. And I ask you to release your glory over my life, over my family, over my children, over my grandchildren, over my workplace. Come on, lift your voice. God, release your glory over my neighborhood, over my city. Come on, I want you to speak the name of your city to the Lord and just ask God to release his glory over your city. Come on, speak it out. Speak it out. God, release your glory today. Release your glory over Greenwich, Lord, over Stanford, over Port Chester, God, over Rye, over White Plains, God, over Armonk, Lord, God, over New Rochelle, over Mimarinic, Lord, all over Westchester County, God, release your glory. Come on, church, cry aloud, cry aloud and spare not. God, release your glory over Fairfield County, God. Lord, release your glory over New York City. Come on. Cry out to the Lord for New York City today. Oh, Lord, release your glory over the Bronx, Lord God. Release your glory over Staten Island. Release your glory over Manhattan, Lord. Release your glory over Queens. Release your glory over Brooklyn, Lord, today. Come on, cry out to the Lord. Say, God, send your glory. Send your glory. Send your glory, Lord God. Come on, I want you to take one minute and lift your hands again. And I want you to cry out to God for his mercy on America. Cry out to God for his mercy on America with all the problems. We believe, God, we believe that you want to save, Lord God. We believe that you desire and that you're still able, Lord, to take our land from being a curse to being a praise. God, we ask for your glory to come to Washington, D.C. today. God, we thank you. We thank you for sparing us. We thank you for mercy, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We ask you to turn away from judgment and wrath, Lord God. And we ask you to release mercy. God, those four sailors on that ship, Lord, they sparked something off. And we ask that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would flow through our nation, through our capital city today. God, would you touch our president with your glory? Would you touch our Congress with your glory, Lord God? Would you touch our courts and our judges with your glory? God, would you touch every governor, Lord God, with your glory? God, would you touch every school in this country with your glory? Come on, think of that school that's in your neighborhood. God, touch your schools, the schools of America with your glory, Lord God. God, I ask that you would paralyze the works of the enemy, Lord, in our nation today. God, release the conviction of the Spirit. Lord, let your glory be over every church, Lord God. Every Christian worker, Lord, every pastor, every teacher, every leader, every Sunday school teacher, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, pray this with me. Say, God, establish my life. Establish my house. Make them strong. God, I will give you no rest until my home, until my city causes people to give you praise. I'm back on my post again. And I am a watchman. Come on, praise Jesus in this house. Bless you, Lord. Hosanna, Lord. Hosanna, save now, God. Save now. Save now, God.
Praise the Lord. You're commissioned as watchmen on the wall. Come on, take hands together. We've got to go quick. Folks are waiting to come in. Think about that. We're going to keep crying out to the Lord, Hosanna. Hoshana, it means God save. It means save now. Send salvation, send healing, send deliverance now. That's what it means when you're crying out to Jesus. We want that salvation and that glory. But as I said, there's a missing character in the drama. It's you and me whom God has positioned on the wall to cry out to him until those things that he's promised and said that's on his heart, until those things become a reality. So make sure, make sure that you pick your time, pick your hour of the day. Make sure you pick, go before the Lord this week and say, God, what's my day? What's my day to start fasting and praying for my city? What's my day to start fasting and praying for my